I am Rodrigo Medellin, and I'm a professor of uh, ecology at the National Autonomous University of Mexico in the Institute of Ecology. I am also co-chair of the IUCN Bat Specialist Group. Uh, I am scientific counselor for the Convention on Migratory Species, and I am also uh, one of the three ambassadors for Eurobats, uh, which I wear proudly and promote the good name of bats wherever I go. Unfortunately, there's a number of animals that, are, that have a negative connotation to their image. Think of sharks, think of scorpions, think of snakes, think of, think of bats. None of them is more unfairly treated and unjustifiably uh, considered a bad omen than bats. Bats provide more benefits to your everyday life than any other group of animal that you can think of. Bats provide three main ecosystem services that touch our everyday life. Number one is pest control. Three-fourths of the bat species in the world are insect eaters. And we've estimated that just in the north of Mexico we have between 20 and 40 million bats of one species. Each million bats destroys 10 tons of insects every night. That in itself, just think for a second what 10 tons of insects look like, and it's an incredible amount. So we have a big ally in terms of our agriculture in insect eating bats. Number two, seed dispersal. There's many tropical and subtropical species of plants that rely on bats to move their seeds. And rainforests and tropical forests everywhere rely on the bats to move their seeds and to, to re, uh, reforest, restore all of those, all of those forests. When, we, when, when humans destroy them, the first plants to grow are those plants for which the seeds were planted by the bats. And we've been looking for a group of Africans who could help us um, bring together the, the information that we have about this flying fox that comes together from every, con every corner in Africa, from West Africa, from East Africa, and from Southern Africa. They come together in Zambia, in Kasanka National Park. They come in Kasanka National Park in numbers that range to 25 million flying foxes in one park, and the park is small. You can imagine the level of impact that those animals have in the functioning of that ecosystem, and of course all over Africa. The shape of what you see in the savannas of Africa, in the rainforests of Africa, is very strongly influenced by bats. And at the same time, there's many species of ecologically and economically important plants, many, many fruits that we eat, that we owe to the fact that bats have been dispersing the seeds for millions and millions of years. So there's another link. And the third link, pollination. There's many species of plants that rely on bats to, to, to close their uh, cycle, their life cycle. Pollination is carried out by bats in, for example, the columnar cacti, the typical examples of the uh, Mexican desert. Uh, they rely on bats for their pollination. Bats do migrate across very long distances, very long distances. Only recently, only last year, we learned that our own tequila bats, the nectar feeding bats, the lesser long nosed bats, are moving between 50 and 100 kilometers one night, one way, and then coming back to every night to suckle their young. In the process, they are uh, crossing a border. They do that, bats do that all the time. They're moving, big numbers of bats move from one country to another and back, nightly or seasonally or yearly. They do that all the time. That means that if it's not through international collaboration, we will not be able to save the vast majority of the bats. Basically, bat conservation initiatives rely on international cooperation for success. Without international cooperation, we are not 
envisioning the full scope of the benefits of the bats. Think for a second in communicant vases like that. Um, the United States may have a population in the summer of the free tail bats and they are eating all of the pests. But then in the winter, they come back to Mexico. If Mexico is not protecting those populations, then the ecosystem service in the U.S. is going to disappear. And the opposite is true as well. If the U.S. is not protecting those bats, in the winter we will not have that ecosystem service there. That is exactly the same uh, scope and scale that we, you see in Europe or in Africa or in Asia or in Australia. Everywhere bats migrate, they rely on international cooperation for purposes of providing the ecosystem services and keeping the species in place. The origin of Eurobats is exactly that. The awareness of the fact that you are all sharing one common humongous population of bats of many, many species. And they move from Spain to Portugal to France to uh, Germany to everywhere. They move all over the continent. And that is precisely what gave way to creating something called Eurobats, which is actually a model that we're using to replicate these ideas of um, international collaboration towards conservation of bats and other things. Over the past 20, almost 20 years, I've been pushing to have an agreement similar to Eurobats in North America. We finally signed a letter of intent to create this agreement last year, in 2015, in San Diego, California. The three federal governments of Canada, Mexico and the US recognize the fact that bats are a top conservation priority. And what we want now is, from now on, we're going to work on a memorandum of understanding which is going to bring in specific activities, specific objectives and goals so that bats remain in the ecosystems as they should be, providing those services that we all rely on. Uh, okay, there's several threats that uh, we have identified over the years that affect bats globally or in certain regions of the world. Uh, first and foremost, vandalism and misunderstanding of the, the roles that they play in the ecosystems is probably the top threat to bats. So many caves are destroyed by people who have no idea and they, they just go to a cave and they burn it or they dynamite it or they seal it or they kill every animal that they, that's, that's inside. That is one key threat. Another threat, of course, is deforestation, and that affects certain groups of animals here and there. Uh, and another threat is, uh, is uh, emerging infectious diseases, both the diseases that are affecting humans that uh, we don't clearly understand, but, I mean, the public doesn't clearly understand why is that coming from bats, and it's basically because of the lack of conservation in their original natural forests. If we keep the forests in place, then we will not have those incredible outbreaks of, of uh, emerging infectious diseases. The wind energy is one of the most environmentally friendly types of energy, but there's costs to that. And the costs are specifically the fact that they're killing thousands and thousands of bats and is increasingly becoming a major threat. Um, our results indicate that just in the United States, Windmills are killing about 600 to 800,000 bats every year. So uh, uh, a new technique, a new uh, mitigation measure, which is called curtailment, makes all the sense in the world. It's basically when you have um, a wind speed of three meters per second, you have a lot of insects up there and therefore you have a lot of bats eating those insects, right? At three meters per second, you're barely producing any energy. At six meters per second, it's too fast, and therefore there's hardly any insects, and therefore there's hardly any bats. And between three meters per second and, three, and six meters per second, you're only producing about 1% of the energy that any one wind turbine is producing over a year. So we're asking the companies 
to change the kick in speed from three meters per second to six meters per second. That is going to drop the bat mortality by 70%. Another mitigation measure that we're, that we're proposing to the agencies is that, uh, to the companies, is that, for example, along the Appalachians, there, that is the migrating corridor for hoary bats, for red bats, for silver hair bats. So what we're asking is that they turn them off during the migration season which is like two weeks in the fall, two weeks in the spring, and then that is going to reduce a lot of the mortality. What I say to the new generations it's, is that it's, it's time. Enough of abusing bats, enough of neglecting bats. It's time to act. It's time to talk in the office, at school, at home, with your friends, with your relatives. You talk. You convey the message. You bring the, the stories and the evidence and the images to everyone around you and show them how important really bats are for our everyday life. And you know, with the right information, people get it in a flash. They change their attitude. And this is exactly the change that we're trying to promote in the new generations.